Good evening again. Once again, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us here on Open Line. Tonight we are talking about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Dr. Thomas Schwartz from Vanderbilt University is our guest tonight. We're not only talking about what is happening now, the implications of what is happening, but the history of this region. And of course, we're taking your phone calls. Mike is on the line getting us started tonight. Hi, Mike. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of statements, then I'd like to uh, ask you a question, if I may. Uh, as you know, China has spent the last 25 or 30 years trying to build up a trade relationship with the West, uh, has been uh, very uh, prosperous in dealing with European countries. Uh, the United States and uh, many parts of South America and, and Africa. Uh, it strains me to find a reason why China, who has potentially been in conflict with Russia over boundaries uh, uh, in the uh, eastern part of Asia, uh, that they would throw away everything that they built as far as a trade network just to come to Russia's aid. Uh, I'd like your opinion. Uh, as to whether or not China is really wise enough to avoid this this pitfall, because if Russia goes down, China has seen what the world will do to to uh, someone who uh, is lawless, uh, and if they want to step in the line of that same kind of punishment, uh, it will astound me. Uh, doctor, what do you think? And, and by the way, Mike, I'm going to hang up so you can listen to your TV. It's a little bit easier that way. Thank you for the great question. Go ahead. Well, I, I would love it if Mike was in the Chinese Politburo to make this, <laughs> this argument because he's absolutely right in many respects that, that, that China has built up an, an incredible uh, economic relationship. China is an extraordinary economic <laughs> power now. It's done that in large measure through its connection to the West and through um, the technology uh, uh, and economic uh, uh, trading relationships it's established. Uh, what we might be seeing here, though, is a situation in which you have uh, an absolute ruler in China, Xi Jinping, who has dreams of glory for China, um, in particular in terms of extending its empire, where he's willing to run these risks, um, particularly with uh, backing Russia in this situation, um, seeing it as more in his interest to back Russia, a fellow autocratic state that also doesn't like the fact that the United States and the West seem to run international relations and would like international relations to be more amenable to China and Russia's form of government and form of behavior. He may be willing to take that gamble. Um, I would imagine there are people in the Politburo um, who might be saying, if they're courageous enough to him, that this is a bad idea. Um, but China has at times uh, made gambles that didn't make a lot of sense. Um, for example, it is uh, still uh, propping up North Korea, even though North Korea is uh, developing a bomb. It's North Korea is not as important economically as South Korea. There's a lot of rational reasons for China to cut the cord there, but they feel very tied to their former ally. In many respects, they may see that with Russia, although they've had, the, the, Mike was right to say they've had conflicts with Russia. Um, people or leaders don't always make decisions as rational mm -hmm. as we might think they should in terms of economics or, or other concerns. And it may be that China uh, does make a gamble that it can get away with supporting Russia in doing something it wants to see done, namely legitimize, you might say, the use of force in international relations to solve uh, territorial boundaries. Um, but I think he raises, Mike raises a point that China might decide, no, it's too important to us to stay tied to the West, and we're going to try and shut down the war. You mentioned the intelligence of this war has been so very good, and it seems right there on the undertones is kind of examining the psychological state of these two leaders, what's motivating them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think that's 
the area where intelligence is having the has the weakest because that is so uncertain in getting close to the leaders in terms of really understanding what makes them tick. What's been excellent about the intelligence is just the ability to see clearly where military forces were going, what was being deployed, how they were being uh, set up, and also uh, being able to listen in on Russian communications to the point of knowing yeah. when orders were going out for the invasion. Let's get back to the lines. We have Becky on the line. Becky, thank you for your call. Go ahead. Yes, I would be interested in knowing uh, our uh, guest, his opinion on whether all of this conflict might lead to a World War III. It's something a lot of people have asked. All right, Becky, I'm going to hang up. You can listen to your TV. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that is certainly obviously on people's minds. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is what the president says is a, is his reason for not uh, having a no-fly zone and not sending fighters to Ukraine. Um, there's no question that Russia sees this as very important, and um, Putin seems to be threatening that he'd be willing to use um, uh, even nuclear weapons to defend Russia's interest here, and that immediately means World War III. Um, he may be bluffing. Hmm. We don't know. Um, and I think, but it, it seems to have had its effect. I don't think we're headed toward World War III for a lot of reasons. I think, I think there's enough of a, a rational sense within the Russian elite that that could be suicidal for the state and for the leadership there. On the other hand, I think um, Putin has certainly deployed this threat effectively to paralyze um, the Western response and to make uh, the West very cautious about aiding Ukraine in ways that I think um, are going to perpetuate the bloodshed there and, and I think are going to be very frustrating to us to watch yeah. uh, because it, I think without that threat, I think more would be done to try and help the Ukrainians than we have. Just today, President Biden approved 200 million more in security aid. This brings our total, the U.S. aid total, to 1.2 billion. But yet, we're still pulled back yeah. from the country, as many European troops are, sitting there supporting from afar. Right. And we're watching, we're watching yeah. um, <clears throat> incidents of, of destruction, attacks on civilians, attacks on hospitals, that in, a, in another case, in a different war zone, um, such as what happened in Iraq and with weaker powers right. we've tried to do no-fly zones and things like that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you about the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. You you teach students at Vanderbilt mm -hmm. every day. Many of these students were not alive when 9-11 happened. Right. They were maybe babies when we went to war. Um, I wonder how they perceive this and the questions they're asking. Well, it's been interesting. Earlier in the semester, you know, I'm teaching a, a class uh, dealing with the, the broader history of, of 20th century America with, with a, a, a very prominent Washington journalist, David Marinus, and we were talking about the willingness of Americans to fight in the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. There were Americans, particularly on the left, who wanted to go over to Spain to fight in that Civil War because they saw that war as meaning between the war between uh, fascism and democracy. Mm -hmm. They saw it in that manner. And we asked the students about that and they were, they found it very almost incomprehensible that someone would do that. And I've wondered, we haven't, we haven't raised this subject, but certainly the issue of, of fighting for Ukraine has come up among some Americans. The idea that this right. is a real good versus evil conflict, you have to go and fight. I think students of our, our, this generation, this is shocking to see war in quite as crude and direct a manner as they're seeing it. And I think it's going to have an impact, it probably not as, not as great an impact as something like 9-11 did in terms of really mm -hmm. shocking people with the death of Americans. But it's certainly going to uh, perhaps have an impact in thinking about what can actually happen in the world. That you know, there are people out there, there are countries out there willing to actually undertake aggression and war. So things that people had started to think, well, you know, we have all this technology now and we're all interconnected. Nobody's going to go to war anymore. Well, they are. And yeah. they, they're still, military force still matters. 
And it might be a bit of a, a sobering thought for a lot of students. I haven't, uh, we haven't gotten this far yet to really see it, but I think it may ultimately be a type of sobering uh, realization that the world hasn't changed as much as maybe we think. And that freedom is very fragile. That freedom is fragile and that it requires defense. Yeah. On that note, we're going to take another commercial break. Some great calls this uh, segment. I would love to have some more. 615-737-PLUS. Stay with us.